On the same page from your Bedford Public Library. My name is Patricia Klein Millard, and I'm joined today by Angela Sylvia, Emily Weiss, and Caitlin Loving. And we're going to be diving into the second part of our science fiction exploration. So let's go ahead and get started. So today I thought we'd just start off with a brief history of science fiction. Um, you know, there's not really a point where anyone said, ah, yes, let's go out and invent science fiction. So it's kind of a squidgy beginning. There's a lot of contenders for that first sci-fi story. Uh, some people like to cite Thomas More's Utopia. Some people like to talk about Gilgamesh. I think that's taking it a little too far um, because you really do need science for science fiction. And so, you know, you need the Age of Enlightenment, you need the Industrial Revolution. And that's why I think as our kind of first sci-fi novel, you look at Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Uh, now Frankenstein was originally written as a ghost story um, and it really kind of takes a lot of its roots from horror and the Gothic, but it's also very much like the original scientific cautionary tale about what happens when humankind's scientific desires outstrip their caution. Um, and it also does have some predictive stuff in it. Uh, using the lightning to animate Frankenstein could be considered a lot like defibrillation. Uh, and you also have organ transplants and things like that. And Frankenstein is not actually Mary Shelley's only science fiction novel. She also wrote a book called The Last Man, which is a post-apocalyptic plague story. So Mary Shelley is kind of our mother of science fiction. So there are kind of three founding fathers of science fiction, and one of the most well-known is Jules Verne, who was a French writer, and he really said he wrote Voyage Extraordinaire, he wrote extraordinary voyage stories. And they were really heavily researched, well thought out. Um, again, there's a lot of predictive stuff in there, nuclear submarines, travel to the moon, and a lot of things he got wrong. Uh, the center of the earth is not hollow and full of dinosaurs. <laughs> Alas, that would be awesome. Um, his, and his work was very popular in his lifetime, and he's, he's left us a large legacy of science fiction books to this day. The second of the three kind of fathers of sci-fi is H.G. Wells, who is a British author, and he talked a lot about kind of a new science of ideas. His work is a little bit more fantastical than Jules Verne. Uh, he referred to his work as scientific romances. And, you know, he wrote about time travel, alien invasions, invisibility, biological engineering, because his personal background was in biology. Um, and he was also kind of a self-avowed socialist who was really interested in society and the way it interacts with things. And again, a huge output of work and, and some really, really great classics. So... The third father of science fiction, and you may remember we had a great quote last time from Hugo Gernsback, and he is the founder of Amazing Stories, which is uh, all the way over on the side of your screen there. And uh, that's when, that was the first kind of pulp sci-fi magazine. Pulps were, were named after the cheap paper they were printed on. And it's part of what made short stories such an important part of the science fiction genre. And you can see there were a lot of other uh, science fiction magazines that came after and of the six that are on the screen here three of them are actually still in print today and It's not and they're even printing like well-known great authors uh, George R. R. Martin uh, Fantasy and science fiction. I've read Stephen King stories that were first published in there And so it's really just still an incredibly important part of the genre and an incredibly important part of the history So now we're just going to kind of breeze through a little bit by decades um, 1930s and 40s, we're still in the beginnings of sci-fi. Uh, the world is heading toward war, and we get two great dystopian classics, uh, Brave New World 1984. You're also getting a lot of kind of space opera, 
those stories and the beginnings of Isaac Asimov's foundation, which talks about really the future of space travel, but also the future of humanity and how society will work. The 1950s. So you get a lot of alien invasion stories, um, and that might partially be related to paranoia about the, the Cold War. And also, again, a lot of dystopian books and I, Robot, which is another classic by Isaac Asimov, which brings us the three laws of robotics, which are actually still in use today, both in robotics and they come up in science fiction all the time. The 1960s, we're continuing the civil, the, not the civil war, sorry, the cold war. <laughs> And um, a lot of paranoia about nuclear armaments, which is where you get stories like A Canical for Leibowitz, where the world is destroyed in a nuclear war. And also, um, and also Alas Babylon, which is not on there, but was written in 1959. And you're also getting kind of things that move along with the counterculture movement. Uh, Ursula K. Le Guin, so we're exploring gender but also um, exploring lifestyles and things like that. Stranger in a Strange Land and uh, the Pern books by Anne McCaffrey have a lot of discussion of, of um, communal living and things like that. And then you also get books that are talking about the ramifications of World War II still. Man in the High Castle, which you'll hear more about later. The 1970s uh, is when sci-fi actually has enough of a history to start parodying itself on uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And Again, we're also dealing with the ramifications of war, again, Vietnam specifically, um, which is where you get books like The Forever War, Slaughterhouse-Five. Dune also talks a lot about what the meaning of war is, and also a lot of hard science in the 1970s. And now we get into the 1980s, which is the beginnings of cyberpunk and a lot of the technological writing. So people are starting to be interested in video games and the internet and ideas like that, and so you're getting a lot more technological kind of science fiction. You're also getting a real increase in diverse voices. Octavia Butler, who's one of the kind of grand dames of science fiction, um, and who's also writing from an African-American perspective. Uh, Margaret Atwood, who's writing about women's rights. And just a lot of interesting things starting to change. Um, Watchmen is also worth mentioning, one of the first great uh, graphic novels. So 1990s, you see again that continuation of the interest in technology, and that's the internet, but it's also genetic engineering with books like Jurassic Park and Beggars in Spain, which we talked about last time. Um, and you're also getting a lot of the science fiction coming into mainstream thrillers that take place in the future or the near future. And just a side note to mention Connie Willis's books down there in the corner, uh, all four of the books in that series won awards and are great books. I think we talked about the Doomsday Book last time. Which brings us up to the 21st century and now. And honestly, it's a great time to be a science fiction reader. There's so much great stuff going on out there. A lot more literary science fiction, lots of really thoughtful works. Um, there's been an explosion of dystopian fiction, especially young adult, post-apocalyptic fiction, um, a lot more parody, humor, technology. Steampunk has really become a prominent genre, um, and there's some great stuff going on in space opera. And part of this, too, has to do with the rise of the internet and the ability of people to easily self-publish. Uh, the Martian, which we talked about last time, and Wool, which we'll talk about this time, are both books that just started out as things that uh, the authors put out on the internet, and they just took off. Uh, so it's a great time for kind of any voice to get heard out there. So moving into talking about the books, because I've droned on enough, um, pulled up our subgenre list from last time. Uh, so we talked about those first six last time. This time we are going to talk about some of the more kind of trendy, contemporary, and lesser known science fiction subgenres. Uh, so you see them highlighted on your screen. So let's get into it. Uh, the first of these, which I mentioned briefly before, is cyberpunk which kind of bases itself off of these high-tech concepts, but it also pulls a lot from like noir uh, mysteries. And it's really about examining how technology affects society and affects individuals. You see a lot of people not only using technology, but taking it into their bodies and incorporating it into their lives in that way, uh, installing chips in their head, things like that. 
Um, and the characters, so the punk part comes from the characters who really operate outside society, are rebellious in spirit, and that's kind of where you get the punk idea um, related to the punk movement in music, which was also going on in the 80s. So one of the great classics and early works of the cyberpunk movement is William Gibson's Neuromancer. And in this noir-like near-future thriller, Case, a washed-up computer hacker, is hired by a mysterious employer for one last job that pits him against a powerful artificial intelligence. So, Angela, um, what did you think of Neuromancer? Well, it was definitely an interesting read. It's one of the first books that did the cyberpunk genre, so it's important for that. It, I do not believe it would be a great introduction if you've never read science fiction before, if you're unsure about it, because it is a little technically challenging. And it does take a lot of focus to read, so you can't read it in little snips. Um, is there a lot of jargon? Or? Yeah, so yeah, there's a lot of jargon, and that can be a little that, that can be a little confusing if you're not used to that. But on, on the other hand, it's also kind of useful for getting you wrapped up in the world because in, in this book specifically, he'll use things like Jack, say terms like Jack to say that he's. Um, for when Case plugs himself into the Matrix, or which is basically going, putting his body onto the internet. And they don't really explain those things within the text. You kind of have to pick it up as you go along. So that can be challenging to read, but it can also kind of help you feel like you're a part of the world at the same time. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And um, who, do, who do you think would enjoy reading it besides science fiction fans? <laughs> Um, well, it has kind of, like you said, like it's the kind of a noir feel, so people who read those kinds of mysteries would probably mm -hmm. get something out of this book. It's also a little bit of a heist novel because they're gathering up the team to do the one big job at the end. So if you enjoy books or movies like that, then it would probably be a, it might be a good book for you to try and get into. Excellent. All right. And so if you think that... Um, Cyberpunk might be for you. Uh, a couple other recommendations you might try. Uh, Zeros by Chuck Wendig. Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash, which has the best main character name ever, hero protagonist, <laughs> uh, who's an online samurai. And um, you may have heard of Ready Player One, which not only has a lot of the cyberpunk elements, is a great book for people with nostalgia for the 80s and 90s. It's a lot of pop culture references in there. So um, another one of these genres is alternate history. And, and there's a lot of people who actually even debate whether this is science fiction, but it's definitely that speculative kind of stuff going on, where you're basically imagining one moment in history that went awry, and everything changes, and you're living in a different world because of that. Um, I have my flag with my Canadian maple leaf on it down there. Um, <laughs> And so, you know, sometimes people are traveling between parallel dimensions. Sometimes it all just takes place in this new alternate world. And um, it's, really, it's really just a pure kind of thought experiment and another way to look at our history and what it means and how it changes us. Um, and so one of the, again, we're kind of going hitting the classics here. Another classic of that genre is The Man in the High Castle by Philip K. Dick. Um, which takes place in 1962, or an alternate 1962, um, in which the Allies have lost World War II after Franklin Roosevelt has been assassinated. And I actually looked it up, and the assassination attempt really happened, mm. um, but was foiled because she fell off her chair. Um, <laughs> but And so now the former United States has been split in two, and the West is occupied by the Japanese, and the East is occupied by the Germans. Uh, so Emily, what did you think of The Man in the High Castle? Overall, I really did enjoy it. It's something I've been meaning to read for years. So when we did the science fiction study um, at the library, it was great to have a chance to finally delve into it. Um, I was just so fascinated by this totally reimagined world that he created. Um, and it makes so much sense. Japan has basically the west coast of the country. Germany has the east coast. I was surprised based on how the novel is advertised. I expected it to be more on the German side. It's mostly on the Japanese side. And while I didn't love the characters, um, and there wasn't a ton of plot, I was so intrigued by the author's thoughts about what it would have been like had the um, Axis powers won the war. And I also um, was intrigued, there is a story within the story of a novel that everyone's kind of sneaking around and reading called The, um, the Grasshopper Lies Heavy. 
And it's actually a novel that postulates, well, what had happened if the Allies had won the war? And everyone's reading it like, oh, can you imagine that would never happen? <laughs> and yet we're reading this like, well, well no, that did happen. Um, but it's a different sort of victory. And I was most intrigued when that alternate world seemed to slip into the original alternate world that you're reading. So he's juggling a lot. I think he does it very effectively. Um, and yeah, really glad I had a chance to read it. And I'd be curious to read more of his works. Um, and do you think do you think it would appeal to history fans, or would it not? Thanks for saying that. I do think so. Um, and certainly anybody um, who especially is familiar with the World War II period, because he does get into great detail, who you know of the German kind of high command would have taken over different roles after the war. Um, and I think it's very he's really thought out very logically what might have happened had the war ended in a very different way. So I think they would like that and just be able to you know nitpick things and. Historical fiction. I mean, you're reading about the 60s, um, but an alternate 60s. So I think so. Cool. Well, well and yeah, it's 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 an interesting book, and it's really? it's there's a lot there's a lot to think about there. Um, so if you think you might be interested in alternate histories, um, there's also uh, Kim Stanley Robinson, The Years of Rice and Salt. Um, Michael Chabon, I should have looked up how to pronounce that. Um, the Yiddish Policeman's Union, um, which proposes a world in which after World War II, um, they've moved uh, the Jewish people into Alaska. I think they refer to them as the Frozen Chosen. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Nisi Scholl's Ever Fair, in which she imagines a, a uncolonized Africa and highly technically advanced, which is an interesting history, too. So steampunk uh, comes next because it kind of takes the world of cyberpunk and the alternate history and combines them. Um, so you have all of these technologies of modern society or even futuristic society, but it's like some crazy scientists from the 19th century put them together and powered them with steam, hence the steampunk. Um, and it's it, very much in the spirit of Jules Verne, and they tend to be these great adventurous stories with heroes and heroines. and. Um, again, you have that punk element, so they're kind of defying the conventions of their society. They're very nostalgic. And they can also swing towards the fantasy. There's a lot of steampunk out there with werewolves and vampires and things like that, which, which are also a lot of fun. Um, the one we looked at for this is Leviathan by Scott Westerfeld, which is much more science-based. And it takes place in an er alternate 1914 Europe where the 15-year-old Austrian Prince Alec, who's on the run from the clanker powers who are attempting to take over the globe using mechanical machinery, forms an uneasy alliance with Darren, who disguised as a boy to join the British Air Service, is learning to fly genetically engineered beasts. So, and I know this is one of your favorites, Angela. Yeah, I've read a couple of times. <laughs> so, um, what did you think? Well, obviously I like it, because I've read, I've read it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Again, I go, I'll go back to what I said with about cyberpunk, where the language is a little bit import, important here, too. Mm -hmm. So there are, again, a lot of terms and things that, they, that the characters use. But I think because, in part because it's a YA novel, a young adult novel, um, the author kind of eases you into it a little bit better. So even though everything doesn't always get an explanation, you kind of pick up what he's talking about, like clankers, the kind of derogatory term for the countries that use mechanical machines instead of genetically altered beasts. And when they talk about the genetically altered beasts, they'll call them a tigeresque or an elephantine to kind of describe what kind of animal it sort of looks like. And I think that just kind of helps build up the world and like the fact that the characters are so comfortable using those terms, you feel a little bit more enmeshed in it. Yeah. Well, I love the way that they brought in the animal side too. So it wasn't all mm -hmm. just machinery and mechanics, mm -hmm. but but that they kind of taken Darwin and gone crazy with him. Yeah. Um, you know, and made air balloons out of whales. And that, are, <laughs> that are powered by its own little biome of uh, bats and... Beasties. <laughs> 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 and that kind of, I think, will make it a little more appealing to fantasy fans that don't necessarily read a lot of science fiction because even though it is definitely science-based because it's biological engineering, the, the beasties kind of... Uh, feel like fantasy creatures hmm. with uh, flying whales and elephants instead of trains. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's definitely a good entry point. For, I think so, yeah. and it's a, it's an easier read, and it's pretty humorous, um, particularly 
Darren's chapters because she has just a uh, very snarky voice that the author gets into very well. Yeah. And I think I think that's something you see a lot in steampunk too, or kind of the the spunky female heroine, mm-hmm. um, who's who's not not <laughs> not constrained by her corsets. <laughs> <laughs> and you get a couple examples of that too. Like there's another character who Dr. Barlow, who's one of the geneticists, but she's a female, and it's surprising to the point where even the main character is surprised that there's a woman who's a scientist. But so there's a lot of good examples of that in the book. Yeah. So definitely a fun read. Um, if you think you might be interested in uh, some reading some other steampunk, uh, Gideon Smith and the Mechanical Girl, which is very much a Victorian steampunk classic, um, Arabella of Mars, where she travels on, on ships to other planets through the ether, and the Iron Assassin, which is more of a noir with an uh, animated clockwork skeleton, <laughs> um, which is just a fascinating read if you find yourself with some time. So now we're going to move into a little bit of a dark chapter here with the apocalyptic fiction, um, also known as a post-apocalyptic fiction. Just kind of depends on whether you join the party when the world has already ended or in the process. Um, so, and, and essentially one of the fascinating things about this is looking at how the world ends in context of society. Is it, is it a nuclear explosion? Is it alien invasion? Um, is it a plague? Is it an ecological disaster? Is it global warming? Something like that. And it really kind of reflects the time in which the book is written a lot of the time. And they kind of fall into two camps where you have these high action survival tales, uh, or you get these very contemplative stories about what it means to be human, what it means to be alone in the world. And that latter is kind of where Station Eleven falls, uh, which is a novel. And it really explores the interconnected lives of a group of people in a world destroyed by pandemic. And it focuses on a theater trip called theater troupe called the Traveling Symphony um, as they roam around the world that remains. Uh, Caitlin, uh, what did you think of Station Eleven? I loved it. I thought it was really beautifully written. Um, It's definitely more literary fiction than what some people would think of science fiction as being. Um, It's not as dark or as violent or scary as some of the post-apocalyptic works that are out there. Um, So if that's not really your style, this one's still worth a shot. Um, It very elegantly moves back and forth between the current post-apocalyptic world and the characters um, in the world prior to the pandemic. So you see how they're all kind of intertwined with one character who's a famous actor who dies of a heart attack just as the pandemic is getting started. Uh, And at first it's a little difficult to tell how they're all interconnected, but the story really reveals that in a nice way. Um. No, this was a really... I, I loved this book, um, blew through it in less than a week, and I'm so glad you recommended it because one of the best I've, written, I've read all year. And um, for someone who doesn't usually want to read sci-fi or looks at apocalyptic and thinks, oh, that's going to be a real downer, it's really, for an apocalyptic fiction, I think very life-affirming. <laughs> Lots of excellent characters. If you're a reader who really is drawn to characters in the books, um, mm-hmm. then I would recommend that for you mm-hmm. as well. Excellent. Um, so, uh, along those same veins, some uh, A Canical for Leibowitz is another uh, kind of very contemplative post-apocalyptic novel. It's kind of broken up into three sections. Um, and The Last Policeman, for those of you who out there who read mysteries, uh, it's about a policeman trying to deal with should he be out there solving crimes. Um, they know the end of the world is coming. It hasn't happened yet. And, and at what point do you kind of give up on the world? No, that doesn't sound life-affirming at all. Um, (laughs) And then World War Z, which is a classic kind of zombie story, but really also very much based on strategy, which is is fascinating, and a lot of different points of view in that story. So a related genre um, is dystopian. And so when you think dystopia, it's the opposite of utopia. The world is not perfect, far from it. It's, well, it's the opposite of perfect. and, and frequently dystopias take place after the world has kind of ended and restarted in a, in a, in a, in a not so great way. 
um, the protagonists are usually find themselves under the thumb of some kind of oppressive government or oppressive society and are put in a position where they have to rebel against it and kind of take it down. And it really what it's doing is exploring ideas about what's gone wrong in our own society, what we're unhappy with. And so one of the prime examples of that is um, Wool, which we looked at. Uh, it takes place in a ruined future world where humanity survives in an underground silo where society is controlled by a strict set of rules and the ultimate punishment is to be sent outside. Um, Caitlin, what did you think of Wool? I really liked it. As you mentioned, it was originally self-published um, uh, in different sections. It took a little while for me to get into it because there's different sections with different characters and then it moves on to the next set of characters. Um, so it took a little while for me to get into it. But again, I think it's another great character-driven story. If that's something that you really look for in your books, then I would recommend it. And again, I loved all of the characters. Um, or it was at least intrigued by them if I didn't love them. <laughs> um, it's a, it is a very controlling society, and it, I'm, I get claustrophobic, and so the idea of being in an underground silo is a little uh, disconcerting <laughs> to read about, but um, it was very interesting. The world building is, is pretty intense, and reading about how the, these silos function and provide all the needs that, um, that of day-to-day -day life was just very interesting to read about. Um, and as you mentioned, one of the forms of control, if you break the rules, you are sent outside to clean, um, which you know people very much want to avoid. But also when it happens, it's treated as sort of a holiday. Um, people who live on the lower levels of the silo come up to see. Uh, there's also always a question asked, why is the person sent outside actually doing the cleaning? What's compelling them to do so? Because technically, they're just sent out on their own. Yet everyone does actually clean. <laughs> so right. That and and the air poisons them. So that when right. they're sent out to clean, they... They're sent to their death. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and there's a lot of that push and pull between people want out of the silo, because it is claustrophobic, but they don't want out of the silo because... Yes. Because that's it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that's the end. But yes, again, you know, I'm sure there are many people who are claustrophobic and then just have enough of it. And there's different hierarchies in the society as well in terms of which level you live on. Um, it gets very classist as far as there's the mechanical levels, which are very far down below, um, but they also run the silo to a certain extent. Um, and there's power plays between the mayor who runs the silo, the IT department, which is very mysterious. Um, so it's very interesting and very, very compelling. Excellent. Well, if you'd like to try some other dystopian fiction, um, The Handmaid's Tale, which of course is a classic and people are very familiar with it. Um, George Orwell's 1984, again, another classic right there from the beginning of sci-fi. And uh, Pierce Brown's Red Rising, which takes place on Mars, actually. And um, again, another very class-driven society where everyone's divided up by a color. Um, so now that we've kind of dealt with those dark genres, we're, we're going to end on a high note, or at least a, a lighter note, um, talking about one of the genre blends, and that's science fiction humor, which is a very common and important sci-fi blend. Even a lot of sci-fi that's not meant to be solely about the humor has a lot of humor in it. And again, you're kind of going from that point of commenting on society to satirizing society, as well as satirizing the genre, because sci-fi can get a little out there sometimes, even I'm willing to admit. Um, the humor tends to be kind of zany and outlandish plots and over the top, and it's very heavily influenced actually by British humor, generally speaking, um, although there certainly are American books, but even then you kind of get that Monty Python-esque style in there a lot. And that is largely due to Mr. Adams, um, who uh, wrote the classic Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, which, after the Earth is demolished to make way for a new hyperspatial expressway, Arthur Dent, our main character, begins to hitchhike through space. The story chronicles the offbeat and occasionally extraterrestrial journeys, notions, and acquaintances of the galactic traveler. All right. Mm -hmm. So, Emily, what did you think of this one? I liked it. Um, and you mentioned Monty Python, so it turns out Douglas Adams was very influenced by Monty Python. And I didn't realize until recently that this book was originally a BBC radio broadcast and only later put into book form. Um, but it's obviously it's pretty short. Uh, it's quick. It's just completely silly and ridiculous. Um, and yet he really is raising some kind of fun 
criticisms of society. He starts out talking about, and there was a society called Earth, and no one was happy, and they thought moving around these little pieces of green paper would help them, but <laughs> the green pieces of paper weren't happy. <laughs> and like right there it had me. Um, and then it gets into this, you know, just wacky interstellar voyage, and um, with ridiculously named characters, got to have a high tolerance, I mean, have a tolerance for silly. If you don't have a high tolerance for silly <laughs> stuff, I don't think you're really going to enjoy it. But if you do and you can kind of relax with it, I think you're going to have a lot of fun with it. It's, yeah. You and Zephod Beeble rocks. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. And yeah. also, um, you know, there's so many references in it that have kind of escaped the novel and just got out into kind of like nerd or geek culture. And, you know, the number 42, and don't forget your towel. And finally, reading the book, it's like, oh, that's where that came from. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. And for those of you who don't know, uh, 42 is the answer to life, the ultimate question about life, the universe, and everything. Um, and I won't tell you any more because we don't <laughs> want to spoil it. But, um, yeah, and he really, he plays with language. He's, he's really a lot of fun. Mm. There's a lot of ridiculous puns in there. And, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. The one that always sticks in my head is it hung in the air much the way bricks don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. So if you're looking for some sci-fi humor, um, some fairly recent publications you can check out. Uh, space Opera, which actually came out a month ago. Remember how I said there was no singing in Space Opera? I lied. Um, <laughs> Uh, and then Tom Holt's Donut, which kind of pokes fun at a lot of corporate stuff and things like that. And Jody Taylor's uh, Chronicles of St. Mary's, which are time-traveling British disaster magnets. Um, so that kind of brings us to the end of our show today. Uh, thank you for joining us, and thank you all for, for bringing us your opinions on those books. Um, and just remind you to make sure that you take time to read. Thanks for watching. Thank you.